Okay, so um, so uh, every Wednesday we have a Bible study. I, some of you guys are well aware, and um, we've been discussing a lot of this, uh, you know, these gifts, and you know, obviously, the what, the biggest reason that we're doing this now is because we really want to force people to to think about what what is the gift that God has given them. Now, having said that, um, we want to also cover, you know, some gifts that are in the Bible, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe, and, and actually there's a disagreement within our, our little Bible study group, that some of these gifts are no longer around, right? Um, how many of you guys have been to Pentecostal churches? Pentecostal congregation? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, or maybe not even Pentecostal, just any congregation where somebody starts like speaking in tongues. Yeah. Same people? Okay. All right. Um, maybe I'll just get uh, an opinion or from a couple of you guys. like. I know that I don't think there's anybody here, especially in this room, that has ever spoken in tongues, or am I wrong? Is anybody here that's ever spoken in tongues? No? Okay, yeah. Uh, so, as, as ones who have never done it ourselves, what, what was going through your mind as you were hearing that going on? Is it nonsense? Nonsense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here's, here's a difficult question because while you were there, did you feel like the congregation or the service as a whole, why, that the Spirit of God was there? Like, was it a, uh, was it a service where you felt like really God was moving? You know, it was a, you know, a holy environment. You know, more yes, more no. What did you guys feel? Because I've never, I don't think I've ever been in a situation. Where I hear people speaking tongues like next to me or anything, so, so I don't know. So you know? my friend invited me to a church. Okay. And I was like, sure, because this was, was an odd friend. Like, uh, he, I didn't know he was a Christian, or he didn't that he believed. So he uh -huh. invited me, and then I was like, all right, let's go. And then uh, the worship was amazing. Like they were just live. They were going crazy, and okay. then. Then somebody started shaking next to me, and like, I'm like, oh no, <laughs> not in one of these churches. And then when he was when he was preaching, all he started like talking and yelling, and then he started talking, you know, shut up, doing his thing. And uh -huh. then I was like, what is going on? Uh huh. So up to and that point, you've never I, seen it first time. No, I never. But uh -huh. I'm like, after once I started. Hearing all that, I'm like, all right, no, this is why. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I was like, there's no way. And then uh, at the end, he kept repeating about, don't forget to tithe, don't forget the offering. I'm like, no, I'm never coming back to this church. <laughs> okay. Honest. Yeah. Um, anybody have a different experience than that? Jason? <coughs> I thought it was uh, pretty genuine. Um, and what they were doing. Uh, for the most part, the service felt like there was a, a Holy Spirit there. Um, I think it was just out of my comfort zone because everybody seemed to be in tune and mm -hmm. you can't really have everybody mm -hmm. in, a, in a trance like that unless they're being genuine with themselves. So they were enjoying themselves and I, I, I think that there is the Spirit in there and it's just something that we're not comfortable with mm -hmm. and don't really understand. Mm -hmm. But it does feel awkward and it, it does feel like, man, what the heck mm -hmm. is going on? Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, I, I think th the closest brush I've ever really had with it was when we went to the RDSN. And, you know, the leaders there were asking us to, like, envision or what do they call it, treasure hunting, you know. And honestly, nothing came to mind at that point in time. So, you know, but I... I noticed how uncomfortable I was in that situation. Like I was just not used to um, having to think in that way. And so, you know, one of the biggest questions is, like, are we are we closing ourselves 
unnecessarily to this whole other, um, I guess, dimension of the, the, the way that the spirit works. So uh, what I'm going to just kind of lightly touch on is uh, the argument that uh, the things today really are not the same as they were when the church first began. That is what I'm going to cover. So, you know, um, obviously there is the counter argument where, where, where people believe that everything that is explained in the book of Acts, that we should expect fully, you know. That everything that happened in recorded in Acts and some of the epistles, why wouldn't all that stuff still continue today? So, again, I'm going to present the argument that things have changed, like things are not the same anymore. Um, that's called cessationism. And uh, cessationism basically is just a fancy word of saying the some gifts have ceased, and but others have continued. Okay, so, um, I guess I have your bubbles? Yeah. Yes? So we're gonna just read a, a little section here. Acts chapter eight. And we're going to read starting from verse 9 through verse um, 18. I want us to really read together. Everybody there? Yes? So we're going to start from verse 9. Yeah. Okay. So this is how it starts. It says... Uh, Acts chapter 8 verse 9 But there was a certain man called Simon Who previously practiced sorcery in the city And astonished the people of Samaria Claiming that he was someone great To whom they all gave heed From the least to the greatest saying This man is the great power of God and they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Verse 14. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we'll read up to there. So, um, what are the things that you guys notice in this little narration that uh, kind of don't make sense nowadays? If you guys can point anything out that kind of seems like, well, that's kind of weird. A man that the sorcery. Okay. In the name of, uh, not in the name of Jesus, but... In his own name, basically. Yeah, just, in his own name, but yeah. people think, hey, it's the power of God. Yeah, okay, uh-huh. Alright, yeah, that's definitely something that's weird that, you know, although people still, a lot of people do witchcraft and that type of stuff, but, like, do you guys think it's kind of strange that um, Philip, the evangelist, preached to the Samaritans, and he was doing... Uh, miracles and wonders and signs they were all amazed so they all believed Philip and verse um, where was it 
uh, verse 12, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and he was baptized. Okay, so um, nowadays, when do we say people receive the Holy Spirit? When do we say that people receive the Holy Spirit? Does anybody do thought about that? When huh? you get baptized? Okay, some people believe it's when you get baptized. Sure. Um, yeah, that's that's a common answer. I believe that people receive the Holy Spirit um, immediately before somebody decides to get baptized. I mean, it's the Holy Spirit that tells them to get baptized. Um, but at the very latest, when they get baptized, you know, like that's, they've made the decision, you know, um, to, they've realized that, that they need Jesus Christ, you know, they have a new heart, they repent, get baptized, you get the Holy Spirit. Um, Jason, you raise your hand. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if it's clear, um, it's not clear enough to me, but it sounds like it. Uh, was Simon, did Simon receive the Holy Spirit? So that's, so, and that's exactly the point that I wanted to get to. Because according to this passage, what was the only way, according to what Simon noticed, what was the only way to get the Holy Spirit? Laying of the hands. By who? By the apostles. By the apostles. Because let's read, let's read verse 16 again. For as yet, or 15, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, for as yet, he had fallen upon none of them. So even though they had believed, and even though they had been baptized, in this narrative, the Holy Spirit had fallen upon none of them yet. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, the way I understand how things work nowadays is, as soon as somebody is baptized in the name of Jesus, if that, if that person has truly been born again, they have the Holy Spirit. So, verse 17, it says, Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. So, my question to you then is, if things today work just as they did then, then what is necessary for anyone to receive the Holy Spirit? What's, you know, according to this passage here, what is, what is the prerequisite before anyone receives the Holy Spirit? According to this passage. According to this passage, no one receives the Holy Spirit unless apostles lay their hands on somebody. Okay? So, um... Does that mean any of us have the Holy Spirit? Is this different than our experience nowadays? Like, do we, um, you know, that's, I guess that's where I'm, I'm getting at. Do things today work differently than they did then? What is, what is your honest belief? I can get an opinion. Anybody? Somebody? Concerning this specifically? Yeah, yeah, concerning this, yes. Concerning this, yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Um, I think that laying on the hands uh, is kind of like asking God for somebody who really wants the Spirit, and it's just kind of pleading to God to give them the Holy Spirit uh -huh. because they really want it. But if it's God's will, it'll happen. Okay. But nevertheless, I think the Holy Spirit can be received just how the apostles received it at Pentecost when they, it came from right from heaven and uh -huh. tons of fire. Yeah. Exactly. And actually, you know, some churches, um, because of this passage, do teach that um, they're still apostles today because they're necessary in order for anybody to receive the Holy Spirit. So once people are baptized, they go back to their congregation and they have the, you know, their members who they consider to be authoritative or elders. They lay their hands on people and then, uh, you know, and then that's when the Holy Spirit is poured out. A funny story about my sister, um, she, um, she once went to a, a congregation, uh, Pentecostal, right, and 
um, they were doing this. They were laying on of their hands and so that people might receive the Holy Spirit. And the expectation was that, and what she noticed, was whenever uh, these elders would put their hands on these people and say, you know, receive the Holy Spirit or whatever they said, um, everyone was falling back. You know, get, being slain in the spirit, right? And um, and she was in line because you know, but she she wasn't used. To, she grew up in our church, so we're not used to this kind of stuff. And she told herself, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be fake. If if these people are falling because really they're getting slain in the spirit, then I want to experience the same thing. So when it was her turn, she went up there. And the pastor or elder laid his hands on her forehead, and she could feel that the pastor was like really like trying to push her, and she was like resisting, you know, and she was just like, she didn't want to fall because she was being pushed, you know, but that's exactly what she felt. So the whole time, she, she didn't fall. And she almost like, she basically stood her ground and, and refused to fall, basically. <laughs> so, you know, she, it was kind of awkward for her and for everybody because, you know, that's what was expected. But, um, you know, going back to the, the passage, <laughs> um, so in your heart, do you, do you guys think that this is different than how it is now? Or should we expect things to work the same way as it did in this scenario? Oh, did she receive the Holy Spirit? My sister? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I you know, I know in her heart she, she believes, she says she believes in Jesus Christ. Uh, but just her personal life, the things that she's done since then, you know, she, you know. What I'm going to say is just... She's human? She's human. She's, yeah, she's a sinner. So... Um, but, uh, so, you know, I don't know. She um, didn't fall. She didn't fall, she right? Didn't fall, it was, yeah, okay. she refused to she receive the Holy Spirit. That's right. No. Okay, so that's just maybe food for thought. Uh, because here we saw that, um, you know, the, this sorcerer, you know, verse 18, it says, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. What exactly did he see to make him conclude that the Holy Spirit had indeed, had indeed fallen on everybody now? Right? He must have seen something. There was some sort of outward sign. Um, because it was to him it was obvious. And so he wanted that kind of power, the power that the apostles had. The power to lay hands on people and pour out the Holy Spirit on them. He wanted that power. He thought, you know, if you read on, you'll you'll see that Peter rebuked him because he didn't understand anything. Um, for me, I think it's more conviction. I think it's people uh, coming to a realization and being convinced of something mm -hmm. that he really wanted, that he really wanted to make people believe that he was something. Uh -huh. And when he saw this physical thing, um, it tells us that, uh, what's the definition the Bible gives us of faith? Uh, substance of things hoped for, hoped for, uh -huh. but things not seen. And the evidence. Of so, not seen. so, just the fact that he's looking at something is obviously not faith. Mm -hmm. So he's not doing things out of faith. He's doing things out of his own glory. Mm -hmm. So he, I think he just wanted attention and to be believed, to be have the attention. Okay. And that's what he saw. But obviously, he wasn't doing anything that was of God. So they're like, you can't participate. Uh -huh. This is not. This is not your thing. Okay. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I can imagine him riding along with the whole crowd. It's like, hey, they already believe that I'm like God's power. What if I get this power to give the Holy Spirit? That'll make me more infamous and famous in wherever he goes. Okay. All right. Um. Okay. Let's read another uh, event. Um, in Acts chapter, uh, let's see, Acts chapter 10, okay.
okay? <clears throat> and we'll start reading from verse, let's see. Okay, we'll start reading from verse 34. Um, so just to give you the background on this passage, um, this is when uh, basically um, the Holy Spirit, God, um, commands Peter to go out and meet a, a non-Jewish person. Because um, even the Samaritans were like kind of half Jews. They were Jewish Gentiles. They were mixed. So, but this is the first instance where you see the Holy Spirit guiding the apostles to go out to somebody that's not Jewish at all, just fully Gentile, right? just like us. So, if we read verse 34, it says, uh, Acts 10, 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. The words which, which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. And we are witnesses of all these things, which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed, hanging by, by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen by God. Even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it was he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive remissions of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God then Peter answered can anyone forbid water that these should uh, that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord then they asked him to stay a few days. Okay? So, <coughs> what do you guys notice about this occasion that was different than the occasion with Philip? What do you guys what do you guys see as the differences between what happened with Philip and now what's happening with Peter? No hands were placed on nobody. No hands were placed on nobody, right? Um, people weren't baptized and they got the Holy Spirit. People weren't baptized. And they received the Holy Spirit before they were baptized. Okay? So, uh, what do we conclude? Like, if we go by this narrative, then what is to be expected when people receive the Holy Spirit? And, and this is where the Pentecostal churches, they use this passage to justify um, what they believe about receiving the Holy Spirit. According to this passage, what is the... The outward sign when people receive the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues. Okay? So, again, like, does the Holy Spirit work today as it did then? Because if we are to expect the Holy Spirit to work today as it did then, then for sure anyone who gets, who receives the Holy Spirit should, ought to speak in tongues. And, uh, but like I said, like nobody here speaks in tongues, right? So th does that mean that none of us actually have the Holy Spirit? No. That's the conclusion we would have to draw. There's no need for it. I speak with my tongue. You speak with your tongue. <laughs> There's no need for it. My dad always told me that 
it's a line with that happens in those <laughs> speaking tongues. Uh huh. Because like, what's the point of speaking in tongues when you don't have somebody that interprets? Interprets it. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. And th this is my idea, right? Okay. I think it was just God's way of of showing His glory then and there when there was so many people from many places, just to show them that He was real. That how could these Gentiles who have never like left the area yeah. can speak all these languages it can yeah. only be a work of God yeah exactly um, and that is um, so the whole case for cessationism and I don't want to go too much into it because I also have to speak about apostles and prophets during the sermon so I don't want to repeat myself too much because we're gonna I'm gonna cover the same thing but uh, basically um, in the Old Testament there was basically one reason why God worked miracles and wonders on behalf of anyone, any one individual. Like for example, um, he enabled Moses to work miracles. For what purpose? Do you guys remember? Yeah, for God's glory ultimately. So the Pharaoh can believe. So the Pharaohs could believe in who else? The Israelites, because the first objection that Moses put up against God is, they're going to ask me, how do we know God sent you? And when Moses asked God that, God responded by saying, this is what you're going to do. When they question your word, right, you're going to do these miracles. You see the same thing with uh, like Elijah, the prophets, all of them uh, had to work miracles in order to prove that they were indeed sent by God. That was the way that God vindicated and verified that what was being spoken by these individuals was indeed God's truth. Okay, so if we flash forward to um, the book of Acts, right? I mean, the apostles um, are basically, you know, changing everything. Um, Especially when it came to opening up salvation to Gentiles. You know, the Jews had always assumed that God would only save His own people, the Israelites. And in order for everyone to understand that the gospel was for the, you know, not just for Jews, but for also for Gentiles, God had to confirm their word somehow. And, and uh, so... How else was God going to confirm to not just the Jews, but the Gentiles, that everything that the apostles were speaking was His truth? God used the same pattern that He always had in the Old Testament. God used miracles, wonders, and signs to confirm and establish what they were saying was true. And so, like I said, I'm going to go more into this during the sermon, uh, but that is... That is basically the, the argument for cessationism. That some of this stuff we no longer need or is necessary because we already have the full revelation of God in the Bible. Like there's nothing else that we need to know for, for salvation, for whatever we need to do. It's all in here. You know? And, it, and all of this stuff was confirmed when it was spoken, when it was revealed. Because the apostles were full of all these signs and wonders. That makes sense? Yes? Okay. You guys have any questions or comments? No? Wait, do you think we don't need those anymore because we got Google now? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, yeah, if you want to learn, know what someone is saying, you're just like, what does this mean in Chinese? <laughs> and they're like, oh, tongues right there. Or you okay. just know the knowledge, you just know stuff that you don't know. Yeah, okay. I think the question is more like if you if you start saying something that's totally new, right? And it's just it seems crazy. Um and we need to know that what you're saying is actually true. Uh -huh. You know, how are you going to prove it? You know, what's on Google? How are you going to verify what Google is telling you is true? Uh -huh. You know? Because you can, uh, never mind, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, how do you actually verify whether what you're being told, what you're being shown, 
It's true. It's true. Right? I'll bring that up later. Uh huh. Okay. So, so that's why the gift of tongues served a purpose. It served as a sign to the Jews that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon non Jews. And it also served, um, you know, as a sign in, ser in services that the Holy Spirit was working. Um, but, you know, we have the full revelation of God now. So a lot of these gifts that were sign gifts are, are no longer necessary. And uh, I don't know, does, did Emmer say whether you would present or anybody would present the opposing argument? No? Okay. All right, so I think that's where we'll end it. Okay, let's all stand and uh